Thanks, Ross. <clears throat> Good morning, everybody. I'm back <laughs> after being gone for uh, almost three months. It was uh, longer than I was actually uh, anticipating. So it uh, has been good. Um, I drove back uh, Friday and Saturday, um, just under 1,100 miles. So if I get a bit, little discombobulated this morning, please forgive me. Hopefully I won't. Um, for any of you uh, who need a Bible, raise your hand, and these guys will get you a Bible. Uh, meanwhile, for any of you who don't know me, I'm uh, Scott Morrow. I was born in Texas, raised and schooled in Mississippi. I'm a physician by training, a sinner by nature, <laughs> ah, but a saint by the love, mercy, and grace of our great God. So that's me in a nutshell. Um, if you would, hopefully you have your Bible. So let's stand, and you can be turning to uh, Matthew chapter 5. I somehow got the wrong glasses. Not sure who those are. So Matthew chapter 5, and let's begin. And seeing the multitudes, he went up on a mountain, and when he was seated, his disciples came to him. Then he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when they revile and persecute you, and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my name's sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for today. Lord, I pray that you'll open up your word. Give us a glimpse of your home. Give us a glimpse of your home heaven, Lord. May you and you alone be honored, glorified, praised, thanked, and worshiped, Lord. Teach us, Lord, and help us to love you more. Thank you for all your blessings. Thank you most for your precious, precious son, Jesus, who died on the cross for our sins. In his name we pray. Amen. So you may be seated. Um, so today we're going to be talking about heaven. Um, this is picture, so to speak, of the uh, present heaven. We'll talk about that a little bit more as we go. Um, this is actually part two in a two-part series. Uh, some of you may remember uh, Heaven and Hell. Uh, this teaching actually started, it was, uh, I looked it up, it was uh, November 12th of last year. We talked about hell, what is it, and how do you not get there. Uh, it was a very interesting study. Uh, we talked about the reality of hell. Uh, I talked a bit about quantum physics. Uh, the modern f uh, physicists and uh, mathematicians will tell you that there are more dimensions than we know. We know four, um, the four, three spatial dimensions in time. Um, we know there's ten, there may be more. Um, so, you know, it's kind of interesting because they've also determined that there's got to be more dimensions out there in places, i.e. heaven and hell, than we can realize. But hey, that should not surprise anyone in this room because God has been telling us that all along in his word it's just that we didn't really understand what he was telling us until current times we're, we're beginning to get a, a better grip on some of this stuff we'll never understand everything but anyway on november um, 12th of last year uh we talked about hell eternal destiny uh, if you go to the website and click on media and you click on sunday mornings you'll see this picture up and uh, that's the teaching i encourage you to listen to that if you weren't here that sunday not because of anything i said but because of God's word and what he says about hell. And you'll learn a lot about uh, hell and what's going on there and how miserable it is. And answer that age-old question, uh, would God send anybody to hell? Well, no, he wouldn't. That's a person's choice. God sends no one to hell. So if you missed that, I would encourage you to listen to it. I would love to go through it today, but I barely have enough time for the material that I have, which is not unusual for me. Um, we certainly uh, can't do anything more than that. So let's move on and uh, talk about heaven. Uh, what is it? And um, we'll also talk a bit about how do you get there. 
First, let's look at a survey. Um, the Barna Group in 2003 did a survey. Uh, the afterlife, how many people believe in an afterlife? Well, 81%, uh, this is in America, believe in an afterlife. 76% believe in heaven. Uh, destiny after life on earth. 65% believe they will go to heaven. 24% have no idea. 5% believe they just cease to exist. So 65% of people believe they will go to heaven. 81% or 76% believe in heaven. So I'm not quite sure what that disconnect is. You would think that if they believed in heaven, they would be trying to figure out how to get there. But anyway, uh, I don't know. That's what the survey said. Um, how does, why does a person go to heaven? Next question. 43% of people answered because of confession of sin and acceptance of Jesus, their Christ as Savior. Got that right. 15% say they tried to obey the Ten Commandments. They're in trouble. Because guess what? You can't. We may want to, but we can't. 15% basically because they're a good person. Come on, guys. Um, the Bible tells us that our righteousness is as filthy rags. You can't be a good person without Jesus. I'm sorry, you're just not. So they got that part wrong. 6%, God loves all people and will not let them perish. Well, they got the first part right. God does love all people. But if you read that verse, it doesn't end there. God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. In other words, he wants us to acknowledge our sin acknowledge his way, that he paid for our sin, etc., um, to get to heaven. Um, uh, also from the uh, survey in 2003, and this is some weird stuff here. Uh, among self-proclaimed born-again Christians, so now we're talking to Christians, 10% believe in the reincarnation, 29% believe it's possible to communicate with the dead, 50% believe they can earn salvation by good works. That tells me they're not reading their Bible. Many believe there are multiple options for gaining entry into heaven. They're really not reading their Bible. Jesus said, I am the door. I am the vine. I am the way, truth, the life. How? What? No one comes to the Father except by me. So, I feel bad for these people. Um, also very strange... Among atheists and agnostics. So now we've shifted from Christians, we're on atheists and agnostics. 50% believe every person has a soul, heaven and hell are real, and there's life after death. How are they atheists or agnostics if they believe that? 12% of them believe accepting Jesus Christ probably makes a life after death. Now, if that doesn't boggle your mind, I don't know. How could you be an atheist or an agnostic and think that Jesus saves? It, it makes no sense to me, but anyway. <clears throat> another survey, this one, we've moved up in time to 2014. Uh, how many people uh, believe, it, believe in heaven? Well, it turns out Christians in general, 85%. Protestants, 86%. Catholics, 85%. This is odd. Jews, 40%. That one really surprised me. Obviously, they don't know their Torah, um, this, this, these this other 60%. I just don't get it. I would have thought they would have a really high percentage, but that's what the research showed. Uh, Muslims, 89%. They got that part right, but interesting ideas they have about it. Uh, Buddhist and uh, Hindus, 47 and 48%. So <clears throat> some sad statistics there uh, because heaven is real. We now know that. And these people who don't think it is are probably going to wind up in the alternative, which is not a good thing. So we're going to talk about heaven today. Uh, the first question is, well, why would we study about heaven? Why do we need to know about heaven? So I would tell you two reasons from the scriptures. The first is found in 1 Peter 3.15. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is within you with meekness and fear. So God expects us to be able to give an answer for our hope. Our hope of spending eternity with Jesus. Why do you believe that? Why do you believe in heaven? We should be ready to answer those questions when people come and pose those questions to us. We're also to be heavenly minded. If then you were raised with Christ and seek those things which are above, where Christ is sitting, sitting at the right hand of God, set your mind on things above and not things on the earth. So God makes it pretty clear there. He wants us heavenly minded. There's an old saying, 
That person's too heavenly minded to be any earthly good. This verse tells us that is hogwash. Because God says be heavenly minded. And as we'll see by the end of the day, I hope we'll all understand this better. If you're truly heavenly minded, you're so busy doing good on earth, everyone's going to love you and wonder what you have and what's different about you. So we need to be heavenly minded, doing God's... We need to be, as Jesus told his, um, uh, his earthly parents when they lost him. Yes, they lost Jesus when he was a child. And he was in the temple and he said, I must be about my father's business. Well, that's what we should be doing. We need to be about our father's business while on this earth looking towards, towards heaven. So another reason is we're on this earth an average person of about 70 years, right? Well, we're going to be there for a minimum of 1,007 years plus all of eternity. So when you compare those two time periods, where should our minds be? Not, not, it doesn't take a genius to figure that one out. But first, let's make sure we've got our terminology right and we know what we're speaking of. Um, heaven in Hebrew is Shemayim. You can also see it in uh, the Greek there. And it turns out heaven is used in three ways. The first is the sky and atmosphere. We think of the birds in heaven, so to speak. That's what's one type or use of the word. The second is outer space, stars, galaxies, what we might think of as the, the universe. And the third is the abode or the home of God. And that's what we're interested in today. That's the heaven that we're talking about. Uh, in the Bible, you'll find that it's called God's dwelling place, the Father's house, a city designed and built by God, a better country, and of course Jesus even called it paradise when he was on the cross talking to the thief. Um, <clears throat> so lots of ways that uh, heaven is described there. Um, a, a really cool way that I thought, you know, what is heaven? Well, another way you can think about it, God tells us in the scriptures that God is love. You know, a lot of people think about God as very loving, he's very kind, he loves it. No, 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 no. That's all true. It's not just that God loves. God is love. It's as if, so to speak, putting it in human terms, he has no choice. He is love. He therefore loves everybody and everything. And he loves us enough to give us a choice of whether or not to follow him too. So, but if we think about it, God is love. You know, heaven is where love lives. There's a, I think that's just a great way to think of it. Heaven is where love lives, because everything there is about love. Everything there is about God and his love. And, you know, it reminds me, I remember when that question first came out with the bracelets and all that stuff about what would Jesus do, and that's a good question. But, you know, oftentimes I would find myself kind of thinking, well, you know, it's kind of an ethereal thought. I mean, yeah, Jesus was man, but Jesus was also God. And if I try to say, okay, well, if I'm in his, you know, what would Jesus do in, in my place? Well, I'm not Jesus. You know, I can't walk on water. I don't anticipate turning um, a few loaves of bread and feeding 5,000 people or any of that kind of stuff either. And I realize if you think about it, God is love. Another way to say the same thing, ask the same question, what would love do? There's a little different connotation that you can hang your hat on. So when you've got a question about finances, family, friends, work, whether to do something, whether not to do something, if I simply ask myself, what would love do? The answer is usually pretty clear. And I haven't gone through all that stuff of this little debate in my mind about trying to be like Jesus because in the end, Jesus, God, is love. So I've asked myself the same question but a little bit different take on it. And um, I oftentimes find that kind of helpful because usually it's pretty obvious what love would do. Um, but moving on, um, let's talk about heaven. So it turns out that um, we talked about the, the three heavens, so to speak. Well, it turns out when we look at heaven as God's home, there's actually two of those. The present heaven, and as we'll take a look at, there's also a future heaven coming, which, which hasn't came yet. So pretty interesting stuff. Um, the present heaven is going to uh, actually uh, be done away with, as we'll see. So the first question is, well, who's been there and came back to talk about it? Well, we know Jesus has. He created the heavens and the earth. And obviously he gave us his word. He talks about it there. But then down at number eight, he actually came to earth as a man, died, went to heaven, and came back to tell us even more about it. And then it seems that Isaiah did. We know that Paul did. We'll take a 
quick look at that. And then we have Enoch and the son of Zarephath's widow and the son of the Shuamite woman. Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead, the daughter of Jairus, the widow of Nain's son. Uh, Peter raised Dorcas from the dead. Paul raised Eutychus from the dead. So we have all these people who went to heaven raised from the dead, but they didn't come back and tell us anything. So that's not helpful. So who came back and told us something? Well, Jesus did. We talked about that. Isaiah, Isaiah did, and he tried to describe it. Or did he? Did he really? Because we'll take a quick look at that. We talked about Jesus. Paul did. They think this happened at Lystra when he was stoned and they, he was left for dead. And a lot of Bible scholars think Paul actually probably died and God brought him back to life. And that's how he saw heaven. So what did Paul tell us about heaven? Guess what? He said, I know such a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows how he was caught up into paradise and heard inexpressible words, which is not lawful for a man to talk about. So Paul came back and said, I wouldn't even try to describe it. I, couldn't, I wouldn't even try to tell you what's going on there. So that basically leaves us with Jesus and possibly Isaiah. But the Isaiah question Jesus answered for us, uh, in John 3, 12, 13, he says, this is Jesus speaking, If I have told you earthly things and you do not believe, how will you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended to heaven but he who came down from heaven. That is the Son of Man who is in heaven. So at the time Jesus was on earth, I believe Isaiah must have been given a glimpse into um, Abraham's bosom, which is kind of like a subset of heaven or something, because Jesus tells us, no, 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 no. No one has gone to heaven. We talked about this in the hell teaching. There seems to be Abraham's bosom where uh, people were held uh, until Jesus' death on the cross, and then he went and uh, set everyone free there. And I believe that's what Isaiah was giving a, a, a glimpse or, or a view uh, into. So that actually leaves us only then with uh, Jesus and the Apostle John. And if you think of the timing, the Apostle John is when? He's getting the book of Revelation and seeing heaven after Jesus' ascension. So now the present heaven is sort of complete, if I can use that word. So it really fits when you think about it that um, Jesus could tell us about it and then John could tell us about what he saw when, when uh, he had these visions or whatever that was of heaven. So pretty reliable sources. So we should listen to what they say, what they have to say. So today we're going to focus on the present heaven. I'll talk a little bit about the future heaven, but we're very, very much uh, focused on the present heaven. So again, uh, it started in what we'll call 0 BC. It actually started before that because God's outside time and he's eternal. But from our perspective, it started in what I call 0 BC. It lasts to the present to today. And again, we know it's going to last uh, for at least 1,007 more years. Where do I come up with that number? we got seven years of tribulation and a thousand-year millennium. And then God's going to tell us in Revelation, after all that's over, he's going to create a new heavens and a new earth. So that's, that's where I get that number. So question, I'm going to kind of do this as a bit of a question and answer session. You'll, you'll see what I mean as we go. We're going to take a look at the, is there a physical description given to us? Who will be there? Are children there? Are animals there? What are we like? What are our bodies like? And what's going on in heaven? So those are kind of our uh, big questions we're going to take a look at. So jumping in, what is heaven like a physical description? Well, it turns out as you read through the Bible and you look at all the passages on heaven, of uh, which there are over 700, I might add, um, we have to be very careful because remember, we've got sky and atmosphere, galaxies and universes, and God's home. And a lot of those are not talking about God's home. So you have to really go through and, and tease things apart to do this. But it's, it's a fruitful study, and I encourage you to do it sometime if you can. But we're talking about uh, God's throne, and that's what it's most, heaven is in God's throne. And that's what most of them are about. Isaiah 37, 16 describes, O Lord of hosts, God of Israel, the one who dwells between the cherubim, you are God, you alone, of all the kingdoms of the earth, you have made heaven and earth. So we see God's throne and him dealing, uh, 
dwelling between the cherubim. Um, in Ezekiel chapter 1 and 10, we have Ezekiel's famous, famous passages on the four living creatures. Uh, they have four faces, four wings, and four wheels, and their spirits are in the wheels. Everyone, I think, has heard of Ezekiel's famous wheels. Um, so there's kind of a glimpse of the throne of God. Uh, in Isaiah's vision, we now know it was a vision, chapter 6, verses 1 and 2. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on the throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple, and it stood up seraphim. Each one had six wings, two covered his face, two his feet, and two he flew. So we've got cherubim, seraphim, archangel, these four living creatures. We have all of these um, beings in heaven, and of course the, uh, the uh, departed uh, saints as well. So again, trying to get a physical description, uh, Jesus said, in my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. And then uh, in Hebrews 12, uh, God through the uh, apostle Paul writes, but you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to an innumerable company of angels to the general assembly and the church of the firstborn who are registered in heaven, to God the judge of all, to the spirits of just men made perfect, to Jesus the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaks better things than that of Abel. So a lot of description there for kind of paying attention. Uh, first of all, Jesus said there's many mansions in heaven. He goes to prepare a place for us. The word for mansions there is actually abode or dwelling places. I'm not sure why they translated it mansions. I don't doubt that they are mansions, but I don't really understand why they chose that word, but I'm kind of glad they did, because I have a feeling they're probably a lot better than any mansion we could even imagine, because God doesn't do chintzy stuff, you know? But we also learn here that heaven is seen as a city of the living God. It's seen as heavenly Jerusalem. There's countless angels there, and the church of the firstborn is there. So those who are registered there in the book of life. So that's all the saints. And if you think about the book of life, I'm one of those people. I believe that at conception, every person's name is written in the book of life. So everybody's in there. The question is, are they going to stay? Because how often in the Bible does God talk about blotting their, their name out? Blotting their name out. If you don't believe in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and his death on the cross for your sins... Your name gets blotted out. You were in the book of life, but you're not registered. Your, book, your name didn't stay there. It got blotted out because of your denial of God, basically. So anyway, uh, moving on. Uh, Revelation eleven nineteen. The temple of God was opened in heaven, and the ark of his covenant was seen. So that tells us there's a temple in the current heaven and an ark. It's actually amazing as you read through Exodus and Leviticus and some of these things, and we see the temples built by the Jews. If you look in Revelation and you look in other places of the Bible, you'll find that they're all earthly models of what's in heaven. There's an ark. There's these various aspects of, of things there. And it's like God's giving us these little glimpses there. One thing that's really interesting we'll see later, there is no temple in the future heaven because God is the temple in that heaven. So pretty cool stuff. So that's uh, pretty much what we know about a physical description. Next question is, who will be there? And of that, do children who die go to heaven? Well, we know that we have a loving Heavenly Father. I can't imagine that he would allow a, a child, I would say an innocent child, but there's no such thing as an innocent child because we're all born into sin. But would he really allow a child not to go to heaven? Well, the answer, of course, is no. But what do the scriptures tell us that we could kind of hang our hat on? Um, if we look at uh, Romans 7, 7 through 9, this is Paul talking. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? Certainly not. On the contrary, I would not have known sin except through the law. For I would not have known covetousness unless the law had said, you shall not covet. But sin, taking opportunity by the commandment, produced in me all manner of evil desire. For apart from the law, sin was dead. I was alive once without the law. But when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. When was Paul alive without the law? The law came down from Moses, right? That was hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years before Paul. The only time Paul could have been alive without the law was when he was a child and didn't understand the law. So he wasn't accountable. He had not reached the age of accountability. 
In 2 Samuel 12, 19 and, uh, verse 19 and verse 22, 23, we'll skip that interval there. But when David saw that his servants whispered, David perceived that the child was dead. This is the child he had with him, Bathsheba. Therefore David said unto his servants, Is the child dead? And they said, He is dead. So there's no question the child had died. And he, David, said, While the child was alive, I fasted and wept. For I said, Who can tell whether God will be gracious to me that the child may live? But now he is dead. Wherefore should I fast? Can I bring him back again? I shall go to him, but he shall not return to me. So David knows he's going to heaven, and when he gets there, he's going to go, and he can see that child in heaven. So, yes, children go to heaven. Next question up, what about our pets? What about animals? Do they go to heaven? Well, we know, we've all heard the story, Jesus comes back riding on a white horse, so we know there's got to be horses there, and he brings his saints, ten thousands of his saints with him on horses. So we know there's lots of horses in heaven. So what else is going on there? If we look at Revelation 4.11, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. For thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. So God created the animals, all they're part of all things, for his pleasure. So we know off the bat that he loves his animals. And what does Genesis tell us? He created, it was good. He created, it was good. He created, it was good. So he knows, so he created them good, and we know that he, he must obviously love and care about his animals. 1 Corinthians 15, all flesh is not the same flesh, but there is one kind of flesh of men, another flesh of beasts, another of fishes, and another of birds. And then moving on, so also is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown in corruption, it is raised in incorruption. So obviously even the flesh of animals undergoes some type of resurrection. Um, if we look at Romans 8, 19 through 22, for the earnest expectation of the creature waited for the manifestation of the sons of God. That's going to be us and our, our new bodies. For the creature was made subject to van vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him who hath subjugated the same in hope. So basically, God created the heavens and the earth. He created Adam. He gave Adam dominion. He's like he gave Adam the title deed to the earth and said, you, this is yours. You're in charge. We know also from Genesis that Adam named the animals. But when Adam fell, he forfeited that title deed to Satan. That's why Satan is called the prince of this age, the prince of the earth, uh, the, earth the prince of um, the air. So Satan is in charge by default because Adam fell. Jesus came and died on the cross and paid that penalty, redeemed the earth and everything on it. He just hasn't closed escrow yet. He's waiting. He's waiting to close the deal. But it actually is back in his hands. He's just allowing, for reasons we don't fully understand, Satan to keep operating in uh, his evil ways. So we know that nature, including animals, is going to be redeemed and obviously going to be resurrected. Revelation 5.13, And every creature which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and such as are in the sea and all that are in them, I heard saying, Blessing and honor and glory and power be to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb forever and ever. So not only are they going to be there, even the animals, every creature is going to be praising God. Can you imagine? How cool is that? So, you know, can animals talk? Well, we know that they have the capability because of Balaam's donkey, right? Some believe that the animals actually talked in Eden as Adam was probably naming them before the fall, they probably did. We certainly know that Balaam's donkey did, so it wouldn't surprise me. So now we know that they're going to be praising God in heaven, so certainly in heaven they're going to be able to talk and sing, and who knows what all they'll be doing. It's going to be pretty cool. So who's going to be there? Of course, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, the angels, archangels, multitudes of others, cherubim, seraphim, the four living creatures around the throne. Old Testament saints, including children. New Testament saints, including children. Tribulation saints, we'll take a quick look at those later. And animals. We're also going to take a peek. There's going to be some plants, too. Palm trees, for sure. What are our bodies like in heaven? 
Well, the Bible actually says a good bit about this. In uh, 2 Corinthians 5, uh, 1 through 5, For we know that if our earthly house, this tent, is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this we groan, earnestly desiring to be clothed with our habitation, which is from heaven. We're getting a new body, guys, and it's an upgrade. Boy, is it an upgrade. You know, so and then you can read about how it talks about it. We're burdened and all this stuff. So we're going to get a body made by God. It's going to be multidimensional. Right now we're tied into our four dimensions. This one isn't going to be limited to those four. We're going to be like Jesus. The Bible says we will be like him. We'll take a look at that too. But notice no more groaning, no aches, no pains. That means none physically and none mentally. No aching or groaning mentally. No more burdens. That's also, obviously, would be physical and mental. So, Jesus' burden is light, right? You get to heaven, there is no burden. Everything is like wonderful and great with whatever we're doing. Um, I'm going to have to speed up here so I can't read through all the verses. Um, Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall be changed in the moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. So, and it's interesting, this twinkling of an eye... I was taught as a child, that's the blink of an eye. No, it's not. There's a word for blink. This is not that word. This is twinkle. That twinkling of an eye is how long it takes a, a beam of light to flash off your uh, cornea. It's one thirty-two thousandth of a second. That's how quick we're going to be raptured. I mean, literally, we're here one second and gone. Faster than it takes to blink your eye. Pretty cool stuff. But this passage tells us that we get bodies incorruptible. They cannot be corrupted. Sin is gone. Aging is gone. The struggles are gone. Bodies incorruptible. We're changed. We're immortal. We'll be immortal. We'll be outside time. Okay? So time can't wear on us and cause all of these aches and pains and arthritis and all this other stuff that comes. Corinthians 15, 51 um, through... 53. Um, we see here that we get bodies incorruptible and we're outside time. We just did that. Um, moving on to uh, 1 John 3. Beloved, now we are children of God and it has not been revealed what we shall be, but we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. So this is one of the key verses that tells us we're going to be like Jesus. And finally, Right now, no man can see God in these bodies because we would just, he's so awesome and holy, we would just die immediately. But then, we're going to be like Jesus, and we can actually see God face to face. What a glorious, wonderful, wonderful day that will be. And then in uh, Luke 24, 36 through 43, Jesus said, um, so the disciples are in the upper room, they've closed and locked the door because they're scared, and they're sitting there doing whatever, and Oof, Jesus is in the room. Then open the door. Poof, he was there. So, and then, and then he later says, do you have anything to eat? So we learn from this that we will have bodies like Jesus. We'll be multidimensional. We can appear and disappear in a room or go wherever we want. We might call that flying. I think that's where we get the idea of angels flying. I don't think angels are flapping wings flying. I think they're flying is because they're multidimensional. They can just whoop from place to place, and it almost seems like they're flying. We'll be able to do that. Obviously, we can eat and drink. Jesus ate and drank almost every time he met with people after the resurrection. He cooked breakfast on the seashore of the Galilee, right? And he asked here about something to eat. We also know about the marriage supper of the Lamb, which tells us we're going to eat and drink in heaven. Well, that must also mean that I'll bet you we can walk on water. I don't know that we'll want to, but it's pretty cool. If we're going to be like him, we could actually walk on water in those new bodies. So next question up, uh, what's going on? What will we be doing in heaven? And it turns out we're going to be doing a lot. First question up, will there be uh, crying in heaven? Are there tears in heaven? Yes, there are. We've all been misinformed, okay? Because Revelation 7:17. For the Lamb who is in the midst of the throne will shepherd them and lead them to the living fountains of water. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. 
That's in Revelation 7. Notice that's before all the great tribulation and all that stuff starts, what I would call the present heaven. Revelation 21, 4 says, And God shall wipe all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. And we'll also look at a verse in Isaiah later on this. But what appears to be happening here is there are, heaven, there are tears in the present heaven. When God creates the new heaven, all of that is past. There's no more crying in that heaven. But in this heaven, apparently there are some tears because if there's not, God's, what's he wiping away? He tells us it's tears. So the question comes up, well, why would there be tears in heaven? Um, some scholars believe it's regret. We're crying because of regret, because of things we didn't do on earth, people we didn't tell about Jesus, good deeds we knew we could have done, but we didn't. So tears of lost opportunity of regret. That's certainly possible, I don't deny it. I lean toward the idea, I think, that we, when we see him and we see the scars and we realize how horrible, how horrific his beatings and death on the cross was to take our sin on him, I think they're tears of thanks, thanksgiving to him. And we should not forget, it could be some of both. No, it certainly could be both. Um, <clears throat> so what's going on in heaven? Again, Jesus said, in my, house, in my Father's house are many mansions. I go to prepare a place for you. And we talked about mansions. So Jesus is building. He's been preparing for over 2,000 years. God created the heavens and the earth in six days. And we go out and see this. Can you imagine after over 2,000 years? Any mansions in my Father's house. Wow. Um, in Revelation 7, 9 through 12, we see peoples of all kindreds and tongues and colors and types and everything you can imagine. So we know that people from all the four corners of the earth are there. Uh, multinational people. They're clothed in white. They've been washed by the blood. They're in Jesus' robe of righteousness that he gives us, not our righteousness. In his righteousness we're clothed. We also see here in this verse that they're doing palm branches, which tells me there's palm trees. So, being a gardener, I think it's going to be flowers beyond our wildest imagination in heaven. Uh, we also see the four living creatures again, and we find that the people are proclaiming and giving thanksgiving. So, obviously, there's going to be a lot of proclaiming and giving of thanksgiving in heaven. Revelation 7, 14 through 17, <clears throat> and then Revelations 23 through 3 tells us that we'll be serving him. <clears throat> Revelation 22, 3 says, And there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him. <clears throat> so we're going to be, we're going to have duties and responsibilities in heaven, guys. We're not going to be sitting around doing nothing. We're going to be singing and praising and worshiping and serving him and doing who knows what. I have no idea what all we'll be doing. But we're going to have some responsibility there. I don't know where this idea of sitting on a cloud playing a harp came from. But I can tell you one thing. It didn't come from the Bible. It's somebody's vivid imagination. We also learn here that there's no more hunger, no more thirst. We will eat, but not because we're hungry. So we'll be able to eat in celebration of heaven and all that Christ did. There's no sun. There's no heat, uh, so obviously people aren't going to get hot and sweat. Uh, there's also living fountains of water flowing, and also our tears will be wiped away by God, as, uh, as we looked at earlier. Um, in Philippians 2, 8 through 11, And behold, found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became uh, obedient to the point of death, even to the death of the cross. This is talking about Jesus. And notice it goes on to say, uh, at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow of those in heaven and those on earth and those under the earth, and that every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. So obviously in heaven, yes, we'll be bowing before the throne, bowing before Jesus, confessing him as Lord and glorifying God. Uh, <clears throat> interesting verse, but do you not know that you shall judge angels? How much more than things that pertain to this life? So we will actually judge angels. Now, I'm, this is talking about the bad guys, not the good guys. <clears throat> but, you know, it makes you think, if we're going to judge angels, obviously they fail. So one in particular fell and, and talked apparently a third of the angels into that. So can angels make mistakes? Well, yes, they can make a mistake. They made a biggie. 
that makes you wonder if the good guys could make mistakes. And of course, you know my crazy thinking. Um, I'm thinking, I wonder if my guardian angels ever made a mistake. Oops. They're created beings. They're not perfect. They're not God. We know from the fall of Satan and the angels that they're capable of making a mistake. Interesting thing to think about. Um, <clears throat> what's going on in, um, in heaven? And they sang a new song, Revelation 5, 9, Revelation 14. They sang, as it were, a new song before the throne, before the four living creatures and the elders, and no one could learn that song except the 144,000 who were redeemed. So we're not singing this second song, but back in Revelation 5, that's talking about the raptured people uh, as part of that group. So we are singing there. So these verses tell us we'll be learning, we'll be creating. Somebody had to write the new songs, right? We'll be singing, there will be music, and there will be worshiping. So we're going to be doing a lot of, I tell you this morning, the worship was absolutely fantastic. Can you imagine what that will be like in heaven and how awesome that will be? Um, laughing, Luke 6, 21, Jesus, blessed are you who hunger now, for you shall be filled. Blessed are you who weep now, for you shall laugh. So I think there's going to be laughter and joy in heaven like we cannot imagine. Matthew 8, 11, and I say to you that many will come from the east and west and sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. That tells us we'll know everyone there. We will be one happy family, literally. Everyone is a friend. That's God's love. And we can talk to all these people in the Bible and ask them whatever questions we want. That's pretty cool. Um, Jesus said in Revelation 2, 17, I will give some of the hidden manna. So he's going to be giving us some kind of a hidden manna. Don't ask me what that is. I don't know. But I know it's going to be great. Um, in Revelation 3.12, He who overcomes, I'll make him a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go out no more. I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God. So both of these verses are telling us we're going to get a new name. We're also going to have Jesus' new name written on us and God's name written on us. We're his kids, and we will be so labeled. And it's going to be wonderful. Um, lastly, Revelation 6, 9 through 10. Uh, when he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they had. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, until you judge and avenge our blood, <clears throat> avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? So we see here the people in heaven have emotions, they have feelings, they have memory, awareness of what happened to them because they were martyred. They have continuity of themselves when you think about it. They still know and remember all of this kind of stuff, which is really interesting. And they have some concept of time, at least time passage on earth. So I think they must be seeing this happen on earth, and they, they realize that the time passage there, and they call out to God, how long, O Lord? We also see them praying, crying out to God, which is interesting. Now, the next subject is rewards in heaven, which... A lot of pastors and teachers shy away from this because people don't like to talk about it. They want to think we do, we get saved and then we just do whatever we want and it doesn't matter. Well, incorrect. It does matter. Because as we're going to see, all of the good things that we do on earth, there's actually going to be rewards in heaven. And even though it may be a little bit uncomfortable, I kind of thought, you know what? What I'm really interested in is what does God's word say? And if I'm up here talking about heaven, and I leave something out, that makes me guilty of the sin of omission. And I'm held accountable to him. So like it or not, we're going to talk about rewards. Okay? <laughs> so, not a lot of people, like I said, like to talk about this. Now, first of all, let me be very, very clear, crystal clear. I am not talking about salvation. That is a free gift from God. His work on the cross, you can't earn it. We don't deserve it. It's not about us. He did all the work, period. I am not talking about that. We're talking about rewards once you're there. In other words, at the Bema Seat of Christ is where all of this is going to take place, and we're going to be giving rewards for what we did on the earth for him. Okay? Um, Matthew 5, 11 through 12. Blessed are, they when, uh, blessed are you when they revile you and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my name's sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven. 
For they so persecuted the prophets who were before you. So we see that we're rewarded for faithfully enduring persecution on earth for Jesus' sake. Not persecuted because you did something stupid or something. This is being persecuted for Christ, for his, for your belief in him and what he did. And then Matthew 5, 44 and 46, but I say to you, this is Jesus talking, love your enemies, bless those who curse you, do good to those who hate you, and pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. If you love those who love you, what reward will you have? So we're to love and help our enemies because God is going to, well, not because, but when we do that, God is actually going to reward us for, for doing those things. Uh, Matthew 6, 1. Uh, take heed that you do not do your that you do not do your charitable deeds before men to be seen of them. Otherwise, you have no reward from your Father in heaven. Well, if we do stuff to look good before men, there's your reward. But if you do it out of the heart for the right reasons, you know it's like not letting the right hand the left hand know what the right hand is doing. If we do it with that attitude. We're going to get rewards in heaven for all of our charitable deeds, for helping people and all that kind of stuff. <clears throat> it's interesting. Don't think of doing good just as financial, material things. We're so prone to do that, and we shouldn't let ourselves get in that. It might be financial help. It might be giving them something. But way more often, an encouraging word, sharing about Jesus and God's love and God with somebody, helping them. Maybe, you know, somebody who's sick, taking them some soup. I mean, an encouraging word, a shoulder to cry on. There's hundreds of ways to help people. It's not about finances and materialism. We in America are too focused on that. Um, maybe it's going over and help them rake their leaves. I mean, it doesn't have to be some big deal. It's just showing love and kindness to others, and God, God's going to honor all of that. Uh, Matthew 6, 5 through 6. Uh, talks about, but when you pray, go into your room, and when you have shut your door, pray to your Father who is in the secret place, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you openly. We're even going to get rewards for praying, for talking to God. Um, Matthew 6, uh, 16 through 18, talks about um, fasting, and don't disfigure your face and look all sad and drawn out when you're fasting so that men will praise you and think, oh, how holy and, you know, how wonderful this person is. No, God says, go about your business. Don't let anybody know you're doing it. You'll be rewarded in heaven. Uh, Matthew um, 10, 41 through 42, um, talks about rewards for receiving God's prophets. So if you entertain a pastor or a teacher or a missionary or somebody like that, there's going to be rewards associated uh, with all of this stuff. Even giving a cup of cold water to one in need, there's a reward for doing that if you do it with the right heart. So we need to be very considerate of people because all of this stuff is going to be rewarded in heaven. You know, I heard it said that uh, the average Christian, don't ask me what an average Christian is. I have no idea what that means exactly. But anyway, the average Christian spends more time in one night watching TV than they spend in a month helping and serving others. That is a sobering thought. That stopped me dead in my tracks, and am I guilty of that? So we need to take all this stuff seriously, guys. That, that's, that's, that's what I'm saying here. Um, Luke 6, 22 through 23, uh, talks about uh, this whole persecution thing. There's great rewards for those who endure persecution for Christ's sake because of your belief in him. So I can't imagine how wonderful that's going to be because the Bible talks about this topic, about being persecuted for his sake, multiple times. And it's not just a reward. It keeps saying great reward, great reward, great reward. So if you're sharing the gospel and they make fun of you, the Bible says be happy and rejoice. You know, and you're going to have great rewards in heaven. Um, in uh, Luke 6, 30, 35, uh, it talks about doing good, lending, helping, hoping for nothing in return. So we see rewards for loving enemies, rewards for doing good, and re rewards for lending to those uh, in need. Uh, this is an interesting one. Now, he who plants and he who waters are one, and each one will receive his own reward according to his labor. So if you plant the seed of the gospel in somebody, there's a reward for that. Maybe they weren't saved when you talked to them. Somebody comes along and waters. In other words, they tell them something about God's love or whatever. They get their reward. The one who plants reward, the one who waters rewards. Pretty cool stuff there. Um, in Matthew 6, 19 through 21, this is Jesus talking now, so this is kind of the package deal now. 
Do not lay up for yourself treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourself treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So if you're heavenly minded and your treasures are in heaven, that means you're doing good deeds, good deeds, good things, good things, good things down here on earth. So if you see it that way, it makes you want to get out there and start doing things to help and love people, right? But always do it with the right motives. You do it with the wrong motives, I don't think it counts. <laughs> so always do it with the, uh, the right motives. So we need to start sending that up today. Not only rewards, but we get crowns. And there's at least five crowns mentioned in the Bible. Um, in 2 Timothy 4, 7, and 8, Paul talking, I fought the good fight, I finished the race, I've kept the faith. Finally, there's laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to those who loved his appearing. So those who are looking forward to Jesus' return, who are looking for the rapture, looking for him to come back, anxious, awaiting that, there's actually a reward for that. Um, and then uh, James 1 through 12, we see a crown for enduring and not giving in to temptations. In um, 1 Peter 5, 1 through 4, we see the elders and um, the crown of glory, that God gives a crown of glory to people. And in 1 Thessalonians 2, 19, for what is our hope or joy or crown of rejoicing? Is not even you in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ at his coming? So we see a crown of rejoicing that some people are going to get. But it's really, really interesting. Um, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 9, excuse me, 24 and 25, Do you not know that those who run in a race all run? We all live this life, right? Before and after say, we're saved. But one receives the prize. Run in such a way that you may obtain it. And anyone who competes for the prize is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a perishable crown, but we for an imperishable crown. These crowns are perishable. They're going to last forever. God in his loving kindness and grace, though we didn't deserve them, is going to give them to us. We're going to be so thankful. We're going to just cast them down, on the, down before him on the throne. So it's always wonderful and it's always about him. It's always about him. He is so good and so kind. But your crown can be lost. Revelation 3.11, Jesus, behold, I am coming quickly. Hold fast what you have that no one may take your crown. So that obviously they can be taken. And then as we talked about, um, uh, they're, we're going to cast them uh, before him in heaven. So future heaven, very quick. If you go to Revelation 21, um, we see, Now I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first earth and the uh, heaven and the first earth had passed away. So we know there's a new heaven coming. Isaiah 65, 17 says, For behold, I create new heavens and a new earth, and the former shall not be remembered or come to mind. So that's why I said earlier, we obviously have memory in the present heaven. When this new heaven is created, all that's done away with. So there, there's some pretty big differences there in between the two. So why would God create a new heaven? Why does he need a new heaven? And I struggle for a word for this, and I never thought of a better one after multiple attempts. The current heaven, and if I may use this word, is tainted. Why? Because Satan's been there. Um, Job 1 through 6 says, And there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them. And the Lord said to them, Satan... From where do you come? So Satan answered and said, from going to and fro on the earth. And then in Revelation 12, 10, we see an end to this. Then I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our brethren, who accused them before our God day and night, has been cast down. So Satan is cast out of that heaven. And then God makes a new heaven, which has never had the presence of Satan in it. So if we look at Revelation... 21, you'll find a description of the new heaven. Uh, you'll see the light. You'll see a wall with 12 gates. It's a cube, 1,500 miles on the side. can hold, um, it's over 2 million square miles, obviously multiple levels. It's made of pure translucent gold. Foundations, 12 stones. There's no temple in the future heaven. No temple in the future heaven. We know there is in this one. God is the temple, it says. There's no sun or moon. God is the light. And then Revelation 21, 27 says, But there shall be no 
there shall by no means enter it anything that defiles or causes an abomination or a lie, but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. That tells us Satan's not allowed in anymore. He's out by this point in time. So the million dollar question is, how do you get there? Um, Acts 2.21 says, And it shall come to pass that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. You know, we think of the gospel. What does that mean? Good news. Well, that doesn't really tell us much. Paul encapsulated the gospel for us in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 3 and 4. For I delivered you, first of all, that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. He was buried. He rose again the third day. There's your gospel. Jesus came as God and man. He died on the cross. He was buried, and he rose. He resurrected the first fruits. So, if we acknowledge our sin... Have and exercise our faith in him, Jesus, as the Son of God, Lord and Savior. We acknowledge his death, burial, and resurrection, and we ask his forgiveness by, take, by his taking the, our penalty on the cross. It's that easy, and it's free. You know, I think that's why so many people get so hung up on it, is because it's so easy and so free, they think it's too good to be true. Well, if God hadn't made it that way, we would have messed it up. If it were by works, can you imagine the conniving that would be going on with people trying to work for their salvation? It would be horrible. So it's going to be easy, and it's always free. So I've tried to tell you a bit about heaven. Uh, I know I've done a very poor job because God tells us in 1 Corinthians 2, 9, but as it is written, I hath not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for heaven. Thank you for loving us enough that you're going to bring us home, Lord, that you're going to let us live for eternity in your home. I pray, Lord, that anyone here who does not know you would come to know you and trust in you as Lord and Savior. Thank you for all that you do, Lord. Please lead and guide and direct us this week. Help us to always be mindful of heaven and of you and all we do. In Jesus' name, amen.